Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to th this afternoon's briefing on clean energy financing, what works. My name is Carol Warner. I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and I'm very pleased on behalf of our organization and the Embassy of Germany to welcome you here uh, this afternoon. Uh, this briefing is one that will look, will explore the whole role of clean energy financing. What are the different policies? What's the experience? Um, as we all across the globe uh, struggle with issues of how to move to a cleaner economy and ensure that we are doing everything possible to make that economy as strong as possible to develop robust jobs to be economically competitive in a very competitive global environment and to make sure that we are also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This briefing is also part of the Transatlantic Climate Bridge Initiative, which was launched by the German government in 2008 with the understanding that the common challenge of climate change and energy security is best tackled when we work together. Building on the existing transatlantic relationships between Germany and the United States, the Transatlantic Climate Bridge initiative works to connect all of those who are seeking to make a difference, whether it's at the local, the state, or the federal levels, because they are all important and they all need to be working in a very um, uh, cooperative arrangement. The purpose of this is to support platforms and partnerships that will help Americans and Germans alike exchange their know-how, their expertise, and pave the way for joint solutions, because that is what we are all about, is finding joint solutions, innovative solutions to address the challenges that face us. This briefing is also held in cooperation with the Congressional Study Group of Germany, and we greatly um, appreciate their participation. And I would like right now to introduce Michael uh, Cabell, um, who is with Representative Gingrich's staff, or I'm sorry, with Representative Gingrich's uh, staff. Representative Gingrich is, uh, is one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Study Group of Germany. Michael? Thank you, Carol, I appreciate it. And, um, as was indicated, my name is Michael Calvo. I'm uh, the Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Congressman Phil Gingry from Georgia, who is currently the uh, Chair of the Congressional Study Group on Germany. I um, want to thank both the, the Embassy and the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for holding today's briefing. Um, over the past year and a half, and I know his involvement has dated back further than that, uh, Dr. Gingrey has had the distinct honor and pleasure of now serving as the chair of the, the study group on Germany, which is sponsored by the U.S. Association of Foreign Members of Congress. And what's unique about the study group is that it, it provides an ongoing bipartisan forum for dialogue and cooperation among colleagues, both in Congress and, and the Bundestag. Uh, and this relationship has now been going on for close to 30 years. Personally, I've had the opportunity to witness firsthand a number of positive interactions that members of Congress and members of the Bundestag have had through meetings in Washington. I know that the, the study group has sponsored a number of lunches, as well as participating in the 29th annual uh, Congress Bundestag seminar that took place partially in Washington, but mostly um, in my boss's district down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's really in those, those interactions, those uh, forums that we get a chance to see how strong the, the relationship uh, between our two countries is, particularly given the fact that it really is critically important to the overall transatlantic relationship, at least as, as we see it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Now, as part of my boss's sort of, he will be transitioning off of being the chair of the study group, uh, but first we'll uh, be uh, participating and, and leading the American delegation over to Germany in the spring for the 30th annual uh, seminar. I know that he is looking forward to having that opportunity to, to have another, an ongoing dialogue and exchange with, with his counterparts in, uh, in the parliament. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I know that the, you guys aren't here to hear, listen to me. You guys are here to hear the experts on 
uh, these investments in clean energy, so I will uh, wrap up my remarks. But I do want to say again that, you know, it, it, how important it is, and we think that the study group facilitates a very strong relationship between our, our members of the House and the Senate, particularly of the House, and members of the Bundestag, um, particularly given the fact that we see how uh, Washington now is characterized as being s filled with such partisan rancor that uh, the study group provides a very unique opportunity for members, uh, members of Congress to come together in a bipartisan way and use that as a, a, a chance and an opportunity to have very candid and, and open conversations with their counterparts. And I'm, I'm sure that, uh, I, well, I hope that uh, the, the, the members of the Bundestag feel the same way in, in their interactions and, and their relationship that they have with our, with our members. So uh, I want to thank again, Carol, uh, thank again for the Institute and, and the Embassy for putting this, this briefing on. Um, I, like you, are looking forward to uh, the remarks of the panelists and getting their individual perspectives uh, on where the next segment of, of renewable energies uh, will be uh, will be going and its economic impact. So, uh, thank you again for attending. Thank you again for giving me a few moments to uh, to speak and uh, look forward to the panels. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And I think that your comments with regard to the value of groups like the study group are so important because it really does provide an opportunity for people to come together from both sides of the aisle and indeed from both sides of the Atlantic to really work together, to talk together, to listen to each other, to learn from each other. Uh, our, we will now turn to our first speaker uh, this afternoon to really sort of start off our discussion to really look at how important this issue has been to uh, Germany and and why and a little bit in terms of how Germany embarked upon the this Germany with regard or this journey with regard to clean energy and what it has really meant and and uh, how it is making such a huge difference both in their country and in terms of leadership globally so we will now turn to Dr. Georg Mauer who is the first secretary with the Embassy of Germany. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> it's a pleasure for me to say a few introducing words on the German energy, energy policy, particularly uh, the transformation of the energy system, which we call the Energiewende. But first of all, I really would like to thank everybody who was involved in preparing this event, and it looks like uh, they were very successful. So I would like particularly to thank my colleague, Carmen Christen from the German Embassy, and uh, the colleagues from the ESI, Carol and Amory, for this excellent work in preparing everything, organizing. And I'm happy to be here and joining this issue with you. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And of course, thanks to our speakers uh, who have shared their expertise with us today. What I would like to make is uh, a few points, three points actually. Um, and I would like to um, introduce to you why Germany went this path to change their energy supply. Um, and you have to have in mind that this was done, the decision to do so by a very conservative government, and Germany is uh, an exporting nation, and it likes to remain an exporting nation. It's highly industrialized, and it would like to remain its high living standard. So these are the basic conditions. I won't talk more in detail about the points number two and three, but nevertheless, why I show this is um, the energy vendor, the, the energy concept is a huge program which is much more than only the phase out of nuclear energy. It's about 180 different measures in different sectors, and it's a huge program which will last probably for a generation to implement. And I also left point number three, uh, which I won't uh, explain more in detail, but only to tell you that after one year of experience with this energy policy, if we look back, 
it looks like a mist buster because we didn't experience so far any blackouts or any grid collapses and we didn't import in the net balance in 2011 uh, electricity from neighboring countries. So in contrast, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions even went down and so did the price for CO2 allowances and for the stock market price for electricity. This is, this is a rather astonishing uh, result of having one year of the energy transformation. And I would like to just briefly um, present to you three main reasons why Germany went this way. The first good reason is a successful economy will need a sustainable energy supply. Why is that so? Energy supply, if you look around, should be secure. So everybody's looking for energy security, particularly in this country. In Germany, we still import 70% of our total energy supply. So our um, energy supply is not secure at the moment. The second important thing for a sustainable energy supply is it has to be economic, affordable. At the moment, Germany is still dependent on the high and rising oil price. And of course, a sustainable energy supply should be environmentally friendly and sound. This is, of course, not the case, as we are in Germany still using 75% of traditional energy uh, with the problems involved, like high emissions of um, greenhouse gases and unsolved storage problems for nuclear waste. So we looked around what could be the solution in order to move towards a sustainable energy supply and we launched different studies, long-term studies, and the results are quite clear. There's only one energy source which meets all these criteria for sustainable energy supply, and these, these are the renewable energy sources. That's the first thing. The second thing is in order to have a high share of renewables, you need to reduce your energy demand and you have to increase the energy efficiency. So this is the second point. And of course, the third point is you need a steer, you need a program in order to enhance this policy. And of course, you have not only to increase renewables and energy efficiency, you also have to look for the frame and for the infrastructure in order to feed in all that renewable energy. The second point I would like to make, the first one, you need a sustainable energy supply. The second one is there is an abundance of renewables even in Germany. And I put together a few pictures which some of you might know already. So the global renewable potential is much, much bigger than the demand. You can see the big bullets compared to the very small bullet on the right one in the upper picture. Then the second picture on the left shows you that your country, the USA, has a fabulous condition for solar uh, power. So this, this map shows the solar radiation. And green and uh, orange and red are good colors, much radiation. Blue is not so good. Blue is Germany, maybe compared to Alaska. Nevertheless, what you see on the last picture is Germany has installed half of the global PV capacity. And now these, these uh, these figures are already outdated again. Now we are in the order of 30 gigawatt installed capacity for solar PV. So what I would like to tell you in the second message is it is possible in Germany, it is possible to turn, to move over to renewable energies. Uh, if you look at the historic dates, we already achieved in the electricity sector almost 26%. This is a quite uh, impressive development over the last 10 years. So the second message is it is possible in Germany. The third aspect and which is very important for, the, for today's discussion is um, the transformation of the German energy system, the Energiewende, offers immense benefits. Why is that so? So it's quite clear that if you increase the efficiency, this will reduce your costs for energy. The second is you have a lot of investments initializing with that energy vendor and we have calculated that we gained already about 390,000 new jobs until 2011 only in the renewable sector. So you enhance the innovation and the research and of course uh, we can escape from the, from the price um, increase of 
traditional fo uh, fossil fuels, moving over to renewables, which gets cheaper and cheaper. So uh, last but not least, we reduce the energy imports and we save a lot of, lot of money with that. And of course, we reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. So only in the last year, only from the renewables, we reduce our um, emission balance by 130 million tons of CO2. That's more or less one uh, sixth of the German total emissions. So if we look at the energy future, all our projections and all our long-term studies tell us it will be beneficial uh, after a few years of high investments, it will be uh, heavily beneficial in terms of economy, society, and of course, climate. So this is a third good reason to move over to that new energy system. Oops. So these are a few more um, figures proving or showing how the world in 2020 looks like if we implement our existing climate program in Germany. So we are talking about new jobs, we are talking about uh, awarded fossil fuels, so saved money. We talk about uh, a rise in GDP, and in the year 2020, we even calculated that reducing CO2 will lead to a surplus, so by 34 euro for each reduced ton of CO2. So this in all looks like a quite uh, good story, a uh, win-win situation. And in summary, i just like to wrap it up, my three main messages. Um, the energy turnaround is uh, a good thing. It is needed to achieve energy supply. It is beneficial, and it is possible even in Germany. Uh, it is a very complex task. It will take another 20, 30, 40 years. We have targets until the year 2050. And it needs a political will and a program. Uh, we have started with an energy concept which gives us an orientation until 2050. It will need a heavy increase in renewable energies, intelligent grids, and energy efficiency. And my last uh, motivation, my last sentence is, if it can happen in Germany, it could happen everywhere. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Georg. Uh, we will now turn to our second presenter, Osha Gray Davidson, who is the author of Clean Break, the story of Germany's energy transformation and what Americans can learn from it. And Osha is also the publisher of The Phoenix Sun. And I must say, listening to Georg's explanation story with regard to what Germany has been going through and the plans for the future, it should be sobering to us as we look here in the United States as we are confronting huge policy issues yet before the end of this Congress this year with regard to our um, renewable energy future and, and as we look at the tremendous gains that countries like Germany are making. Thank you, Carol, and thank you also to the Institute and to the German Embassy for putting this panel on and for inviting me to be part of it. You know, the, uh, well, the map isn't up there anymore, but I noticed in the, the map that you had up of the different um, solar radiation throughout the United States compared to Germany, I, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, the bright red part. And I was just crunching some numbers a couple days ago, and Germany has four times as much PV capacity installed per capita as Arizona does. So the good news for Arizona was a few years ago, we were far behind that. So we're catching up, just to let you know. Um, I want to speak briefly about my experience traveling through Germany for three weeks in April and May as a, the climate, a climate media fellow uh, sponsored by the Heinrich Boll Foundation and also by Inside Climate News, who I'm reporting for and funded partially by the Rockefeller Brother 
funds. Um, it was an amazing experience. It was truly an eye-opening experience. I spent three weeks traveling through most areas of Germany, speaking with uh, members of the ruling coalition government in Germany, with members of the Bundestag who are not in the ruling coalition, with uh, people in the industry, in the electrical utility industry, with small business people, with ordinary people, German citizens, with NGOs, and it really was fascinating to be able to talk to people because I had some conceptions and misconceptions about their Energiewende from reading about it in the press in the US, um, both positive and negative, and being there and actually experiencing it. I can't tell you, it's just a completely different thing and I heartily recommend it. Um, I visited a whole variety of projects in Germany, including building integrated photovoltaics in Freiburg, um, wind turbines, the off off -sea, offshore wind turbines in, at Baltic One, which are 10 miles off, so I could barely see them, but I read about them. I knew that they were there, uh, an amazing project many more wind farm facilities on land, which were everywhere. Community, community heating facilities in small towns, rural villages like um, St. Peter in the Black Forest, which is truly amazing what they're doing there. Biogas projects, cogeneration facilities, and everywhere. Energy efficiency programs, and especially, I just want to highlight uh, Hamburg, where I spent some time looking at that. The built environment is such an important part of renewable energies and the whole idea of the Energiewende, which translates as energy transformation. You can't do it without changes in the built environment. And Hamburg, where the first public transportation, integrated public transportation system was created, uh, is an amazing place, and that system now has, that was in the 60s, and it's now taken root all over the world, including Washington, D.C. Um, the reason that I may be belaboring this point is that the Energiewende isn't about one source of renewable energy. And in fact, the landmark legislation, the 2000 EEG legislation, is often translated in the US or into English as Renewable Energy Act. But its true translation is Renewable Energies Act. And I think it's important because what it says is it shows that there's a focus not on one source of renewable energy, but a broad look at renewable energies and a more holistic view that includes energy efficiency, for example. So it's all, all part of the debate and all part of the solution, in, our, in part because it's all part of the problem. Um, looking at all of these things in an integrated and comprehensive, holistic way is really vital to the success of the Energiewende. There's another key that, that I saw which the key to the, the success of the EEG, which is targeting the fastest, cheapest, and most sustainable measures to move to a renewable energy economy. The centerpiece of that, the main way of achieving that, is the feed-in tariff, or FIT. And the genius of the German FIT, and there, the FIT has been put into practice in many, many countries and had tremendous problems in some, some countries and there are obstacles in Germany as well, but it's succeeding there and it has failed in some countries because it wasn't properly designed. And I think a lot, I think the fit gets a bad name in part because um, people look at all fits as being the same. And if it doesn't work in Spain, then well, okay, the fit is not working. It's, it's not a good model, and that's not true at all. Um, 
the, the German fit focuses, focuses on deployment, on deployment, not on research. If, you're, if you concentrate government monies, as we've been, I, I've heard talked about a lot lately, let's focus re money in renewable energies on more research. If you do that, then you won't get the product that you're after. You'll make great strides, but unfortunately, great strides in research, great strides don't produce any electricity themselves. You don't want to produce great strides. It's a means to an end. You want to produce deployed renewable energies that are PV on people's roofs, wind turbines in farmers' fields, geothermal in places everywhere. And that's what the FIT is designed to do. Another uh, misunderstanding that I think I had and I think others have is that the FIT doesn't mandate deployment. It's not a command and control system at all. In fact, it unleashes entrepreneurial energies to get solar panels on roofs, turbines, etc. And it does that by driving a buy-in by ordinary citizens and groups of people. It makes it attractive for German citizens to have skin in the game because they make money on it. It's not altruism. As much as there's great altruism in Germany on wanting to fight climate change for all sorts of, of, of good reasons, I believe that the EEG and the FIT in particular were designed to take advantage not only of what's in people's hearts, but more importantly, what's there, what's in people's minds, and which is, I'm sorry, in wallets, which is why it translates to most other economies. Um, and it has translated. It, it does work. 25% of electricity now generated in, elect in Germany comes from renewable energies, and over half of that comes from individuals, individually owned power generating systems that are by individuals and groups of individuals in cooperatives, which is a whole nother area of the German program, having cooperatives, electricity cooperatives. So people acting together. I see I only have a minute or two left. So let me just real quickly give three elements of the fit that I think are crucial. One is payments are based on getting a returnable, a, a reasonable return on investment, no matter what form of renewable energy you put up, you're not going to get rich. See, it isn't designed to help people get rich. It's designed so that you can get a reasonable return on installing these uh, different energy systems, which then you are paid for producing. It turns everybody into a potential utility owner. The second one is that the payments are guaranteed for 20 years. Whenever you put, put your system in, is that you know the price that you're going to get per kilowatt hour for the next 20 years, which gives businesses what they need most, which is a sense of stability, knowing how much money they will be able to get over the next 20 years. And I, I think that's terribly important. And the final one is um, on the fit. It has digressive, I don't know if that actually translates into English exactly as digressive, but the payments go down every year. Now once you sign in at, at the very beginning, you're assured that price for 20 years, but every year that price for new installations drops. And what that does is a number of things, but one thing it does is it drives deployment. It gets people to put things up there, solar power, wind power, because they're going to make the most money the sooner they get these generating systems up and running. So it drives that, and by driving deployment, you have this huge amount that uh, Secretary Mawa pointed out of electricity being generated. And by doing, doing that, you drive down the cost of production dramatically. It makes it much easier um, to put these things up. It costs half as much in Germany to install solar power, the same amount of solar power, as it does to install it in Arizona. And that's all 
because of soft costs, permitting fees, how much it costs companies to mount them on the roofs because there's, they've done it at such great deployment in Germany that they've found ways to make it cheaper. So before the hook comes out and grabs me, I am going to sign off. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you learn a lot from this panel and that we can learn a lot and catch up and surpass Germany. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Osha. Well, I must say it would not be right to do a briefing on clean energy financing and what works without hearing from some people who are real finance people. So we wanted to make sure that we uh, had folks who could talk directly from that financial business experience as part of this um, uh, exploration of what really does work, what are the range of options that uh, have been tried, can be explored, et cetera, because there's always more than one way to do things. And so we will first hear from Dr. Sabina Miltner, who is the Group Sustainability Officer with Deutsche Bank. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for the organization of this uh, event. Uh, German Embassy, the Institute. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yes, I'm here as a Group Sustainability Officer for, for Deutsche Bank, which is um, a global universal bank, meaning we are engaged in investment banking, commercial banking, retail um, asset management, and therefore our activities are obviously in all those uh, spaces. I will come back to, to that in just a, uh, a second. I just wanted to um, to say up front a few a few things that um, I, I truly believe and and we are um, trying to work um, along those those lines. So clean energy financing is really happening and I think Ethan will talk uh, much more about that, so I won't uh, spend any time on it. And it is, you know, for many look at it as a niche kind of an activity. And, um, you know, sometimes that is also seen in a large organization like mine where they think it is still small, and it is relatively small, and we need to, to face it, but it's not, it's not a, a niche. It has come out of that, and it is, you know, on its way. It's a transformation that uh, is unstoppable, um, and it is growing fast, and it has been growing fast for some, some time. One general point I also like to make, which is oftentimes overlooked when we talk about this, is the need for collaboration um, and cooperation among the private sector in different spaces, sectors, um, across uh, the silos, so to speak, the economy, but also, and more importantly, um, we cannot get this done unless policy side and the business side work together. And there are lots of um, things that we have been involved in. We can perhaps come better in the Q&A if, if you're interested on you know, public-private partnerships and, and how far down the track that, that, can, that can get you. So just coming back um, on, uh, on Deutsche, what we, what we, what we do. Um, you know, first of all, I think sustainability is something that is important to us in our strategy that has been confirmed several times by uh, our new CEOs, our old CEO. Um, we have had significant financing uh, experience in the renewable uh, sector, and that means pretty much, you know, as OSHA was saying, it's not just solar, it's not just wind, it's like a whole spectrum of uh, renewable uh, energy and, and, and projects that are being built around the globe. And we have um, assisted in the financing of something like three gigawatt of renewable installation uh, in 2011 across Europe and the US. Um, in Germany, a lot of the smaller medium enterprises are our clients, and specifically in that sector, in the renewable space, we have something like 50 uh, medium size, uh, so-called mid-cap, the German famous mid-cap, which is the, the bedrock really of the economy. Um, and uh, we are one of the largest, as a financial institution, not a specialist asset manager, 
we are uh, one of the largest uh, manager of sustainable funds. So not just climate, but you know, more generally focused on uh, on sustainability, and not uh, not to ignore because it was already managed um, mentioned by by OSHA the importance of energy efficiency, and so uh, a lot of what we have also been doing is um, focus on how we can what can we do internally in our own buildings, in our own um, facilities to increase um, a the share of renewables. For example, in the United States, we we um, we use a tremendous amount of uh, of renewable energy. We buy certificates to offset the the brown power that we that we buy. But we are 100 percent uh, renewable, as we are in many in many markets in in which we operate. We are in 72 countries. Not everywhere are we uh, uh, renewable uh, only, but uh, in 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 many in many we are. Uh, so we are an energy efficiency manager, and we are trying to deploy that that expertise that we have gained from our internal operations into uh, kinds of in products that we can uh, that we can offer to to our clients. So um, let me just give you just for for one second, perhaps um, a, a little bit of a broader stepping back for a minute from the Germany and the US and, and, and some of the individual countries. You know, there is a general risk management issue that we have uh, to, to handle, and that's the, you know, the societal risk management, really. Because, you know, would you put your child in a car if it has a 15% chance of crash? Probably not. And there are, you know, 90 plus percent of the scientists are confirming that climate change is real. And I know that this is a big uh, discussion in this country whether it is or is not. But, you know, as I said, 93 percent of climate science agree that there is this thing out there. Investing to reduce carbon emission, therefore, is societal risk management. Um, and broader than climate change, there are billions of people who really want to have access to resources, who want the lifestyle that we want. So how can we kind of square that circle with people, the world growing to 9 billion uh, people, and uh, at the same time, we continue to use the resources that we have in the way we have. And that's, it's not sustainable. So, you know, the world needs to transform itself you know, for the benefit of the of the next generation, there's no question about it. Even if you don't believe in climate change, um, so that, that I just wanted to make that um, you know upfront. Also, just a word because it is very big in, in in the United States. Obviously, this notion of we have plenty of natural gas, so you know why bother with renewables in in some ways. And you know, in a way, the 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 wave in 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 natural gas and the fact that prices are at historic lows. Um, you know, two years ago, three years ago, I was worried that if the price of natural gas falls below four dollars, you know, renewables are dead. And I think that was a pretty unfortunate but accurate um, description. So, you know, it's very hard for renewables at this price to be competitive in an environment where there isn't a whole lot of policy support and incentives. So we'll come, we'll come back to, we'll come back to that. Um, so what's the purpose of policy? The policy is really to create, uh, we call it TLC. It's not the fuzzy version. No, we, it's uh, transparency, longevity, and certainty, and. That is really what we believe investors need to make these long-term commitments. You know, we don't need to talk much about the fit, the feed-in tariff as such. I mean, OSHA has described the basic, the basic parameters, but it provides you exactly with that long-term uh, certainty. And he was alluding to to Spain. So Spain was retroactively changing. Um, basically, these investment parameters on on investors. I mean, this is a market that will be burned you know, for a long, long time. Um, so it is to provide this uh, TLC environment where investors have a long-term horizon in which to, to invest and to build up. And that is what is really needed. This is why feed-in tariffs is one example of how you can create that. Um, you know, I, I know New Energy 
energy finance sometimes has a somewhat different perspective on how useful those those are for you know lots of reasons because also what Osho was saying that there is of course a, a possibility that people are you know building up very fast and that is the the ex the experience that Germany has made where um, you know you will have over fulfilled actually your renewable electricity uh, target by 2020 I think the minister is now expecting something like 40 percent instead of the you know, 30 or what that was um, the that was the, the the target because we are already where we are at 25, um, and so that there is somewhat of an, a profit taking uh, that may that may take place that might be excessive to to some degree because people are then guaranteed 20 years a, a certain fit. But the beauty of the German system is that it is that it has the digression, and that um, you know I think we have seen. Um, several evolutions of the of the German of the German energy system uh, of the feed in of the feed in tariff. The first was really focusing on um, scaling up the domestic uh, generation, which has clearly worked with uh, now installed 29 gigawatt um, of solar PV, for example. Um, and the phase two, which is from 2009 to to 11, you have seen this rapid decline in uh, in costs, which again is you know, because of the investment environment that was created, it allows it allows people to 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 put uh, their money into these kinds of products. And now we have phase three, um, where we see the continued cost decline of making solar PV, wind, and biomass increasingly cost uh, competitive with market prices. And in some some small uh, PV installations, are already actually. Uh, below below parity. Um, one word I'd like to make because we uh, are in in that market as well, and it's a hard market to operate. But um, China, China has um, you know really uh, embraced the energy revolution. I uh, I am very convinced um, they have a tremendous uh, share of the market already in the renewable space. And you know, I just want to, to say that in my observation, I've lived in this country for a number of years, and it's an amazingly competitive economy. And what is um, troubling me at times is to see that there is a real risk that the US is falling behind in something which is a real future, uh, future economic development, and that is that entire Technology space that is associated with um, with the new with the new sources of, of energy energy efficiency you name it because all your all the great people who are sitting in Silicon Valley they come up with stuff but in order for making that stuff commercially viable they need a market to sell into and again you know the beauty of the of the fit is that it provides you with a market to sell into because there is an off-taker agreement, there is no discussion, you produce the thing and somebody is there to take it from you. And so it is these markets that need to be created and, uh, and you know, the, to, to really get the job growth, the economic growth, all of these things that we all want uh, going, uh, I think there needs to be a little bit more than oil and gas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabina. We will now turn to Ethan Zindler, who is the head of policy analysis with Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, and obviously, <clears throat> Bloomberg New Energy Finance has been following investments uh, in this technology space for quite uh, a long period and in great depth. And so we look forward to hearing from you, Ethan. Thanks very much. And hello, everyone. Um, I see some familiar faces. I've done a few of these briefings before on the Hill, so apologies if you've seen some of these slides before. But um, And in the interest of time, I'm going to move relatively quickly, but I'm happy afterwards to discuss any slide that you feel like I may have zipped too quickly through. 
Uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, that's us, market research firm focused on clean energy investment, uh, about 200 people globally, founded eight years ago in London, bought by Bloomberg almost three years ago. Um, I, I had our research group uh, in the Americas. These are our clients, um, some of the players you might suspect, you know, people with a sort of progressive outlook on things in terms of investing, but a number that you, you wouldn't. You may see some big, large oil companies and integrated uh, utility players and others on that list. Uh, along with some uh, U.S. federal government agencies and others, all with an interest in the economics of clean energy and most with an interest in making money primarily uh, in the industry, not because they necessarily have a sort of quote-unquote pro-social aim. They are looking to earn money by investing in clean energy uh, or building clean energy projects or fostering policies that uh, allow investors to earn a return on clean energy. So uh, let me start off with the biggest, the big picture, uh, which is the investment in clean energy uh, globally. Uh, you know, we've seen, uh, since our firm has been founded, an extraordinary run up in the amount of money uh, that's gone into the industry. Let me see if this thing works, it does. So uh, back from about 50 billion in 2004 to about 190 billion, even in the, the years of 2008 and 9, the financial crisis, we only saw a leveling, we didn't see a drop. And then we saw a rise to about $280 billion in new capital invested in clean energy last year. That's a lot of money. That's not an insignificant amount. Uh, I wish I could report to you that the, the hockey stick and the, the, is going to continue into next year and that and more money is going to flow in. But we actually are of the view that this will be the first year since we started tracking the data that the amount of dollars into the clean energy industry is actually going to decline a little bit. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Some of them are actually kind of good news. One of them is that the cost of installing clean energy has dropped so much that your dollar simply goes farther. You don't need to deploy as many dollars to build a wind farm or a solar project, so you get more bang for your buck. Um, but the other thing is we're seeing a slowdown in a number of markets uh, around the world, uh, including in the United States, in terms of the amount of money that's being deployed here this year. Again, to emphasize that this is not small potatoes, uh, I just want to point out that the total amount of money invested in fossil fuel generation last year and the amount that was invested in clean energy power generation is not that different. The gap is pretty, pretty narrow, about $300 billion for fossil in the neighborhood of about $225 um, for, for clean power generation. I, I, take, I take issue with the term alternative energy. Uh, for just this reason. I think that it's not alternative anymore when you're talking about this kind of ratio of money being deployed in this industry. Um, so that's mostly the good news. Uh, the not so good news is that the industry is in a state of overcapacity. Uh, there is more uh, manufacturing capacity to make wind turbines, more manufacturing capacity to make solar modules, more manufacturing capacity to make lithium ion batteries that are used in electric vehicles then there is demand for those products right now. Um, and so when you have oversupply, you have prices come down. Uh, when prices come down, those who make, those, those make that equipment see their margins um, shrink or even disappear. Uh, and so this explains why when you look at a basket of 95 clean energy stocks, this index known as the NEX that we run, um, you saw this incredible run up with the price of oil uh, and enthusiasm in the sector, and then you saw a huge crash 2008 and 9, and then you've still seen difficult times. So basically, if you put 100 bucks into this basket of clean energy companies back in 2003, it's more or less worth about 100 bucks right now. That's not a good return on investment. And meanwhile, you've had one heck of a ride. If you got out here, you were, you were loving life, but you know, not so great down here. Um, by comparison, not too surprisingly, we've seen other indices that, you know, NASDAQ and S&P, you know, more stable performance over that time. This isn't shocking in a lot of ways. This is a new industry. Um, you know, these are new companies. These are new technologies. There's a lot of risk. You're going to see a lot of volatility. It's inevitable. Um, but right now is a difficult time for the industry. So like I said, what we've seen is a real decline in, in costs. And I'm going to move kind of quickly through these next bunch just to sort of articulate. But in the, the really the most exciting area, in my view, in terms of cost decline has been in photovoltaics. Um, the cost of a solar module, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is, you know, it's well less than half of what it was just a couple of years ago. It used to represent well over the half of the total cost of a new system that you'd put up on your roof would be buying the panels. It's now well below that. Um, so the equipment costs have dropped very dramatically. Part of this is because of technology development. 
But a big part of it is also just pure scaling up. And I think this is where Germany actually is an important part of the story. Um, Germany, thanks to its policies, created so much demand for solar that a, a great deal of new capacity to manufacture those panels was built. A lot of it was in China, but other places as well, other places in Asia, Germany too. Uh, and that surge of supply has really helped to bring the price down very dramatically. Uh, and the benefit of that, frankly, is going to be felt by all of us, including those in the developing world, who, for whom you know, solar now starts to become much more economic than it was even a few years ago. Um, so to some degree, this is the way it's supposed to work. Wealthy countries investing uh, in the clean energy future to reduce their emissions, poorer countries now starting to be able to receive some of the benefits that come along with that. Uh, this is just a further, another look. You can see, you know, you're looking from about $3.20 uh, per watt system for a utility scale project. Uh, we're looking now probably at below $2 a watt uh, is the current cost for utility scale. Residential is a bit higher, not surprisingly, because they're smaller systems or higher labor costs. You don't get the same kind of economies of scale. But again, you see this big drop into this year, and we're predicting further drop, drops going forward. Just very quickly on wind, similar kinds of price reductions, but not at the same kind of scale and at a slower period of time. Um, I think it's important to note there's a big difference between the wind and the solar industry in terms of the commoditization that's gone on in photovoltaics. Um, there are very good quality PV modules that are made in a number of different countries now, China included. Uh, and to some large degree, that means that the market has become commoditized, where people simply buy the lowest price uh, PV panel they can get their hands on. Not everybody, but in a lot of cases. In the case of wind turbines, you're talking about putting a massive piece of equipment up that's supposed to spin basically flawlessly for 20 years. These things need to be incredibly carefully designed, and thus you do see dis uh, uh, distinguishing or uh, uh, you know, differentiation within the market between some of the countries like Germany and others, uh, Denmark and the U.S. who design turbines and those that come from China. Uh, but the bottom line is we have seen this similar uh, cost decline. I'm going to move quick just to touch on one subject that I know is always on people's minds on Capitol Hill, which is what's going to happen to the U.S. wind industry with and without the production tax credit. This is just our view, and frankly, we update this, I think, every two weeks because the market is moving very quickly. Um, but this is a view of how much um, wind capacity we think will be installed in the U.S. Uh, in 2012. Uh, if the PTCs extend, we're looking at somewhere around 11 gigawatts of new capacity, and then about five gigawatts next year, and eight and three. Um, that, I should note, is not the world's greatest picture. Um, you know, the all-time high up to now is 10. We'll hit an all-time high this year of 11, but even with the PTC, it's not like this industry is going to have smooth sailing the next couple of years. And I think that's just an important thing to keep in mind in terms of expectations for the wind industry. And the big part of the reason for that has to do, as was mentioned earlier, with natural gas. Um, this is our view of what happens if the PTC does not get extended. And you can see here, you really are looking at a very sharp drop to about one and a half gigawatts only of new capacity installed next year. Um, interestingly enough, the amount that gets installed this year actually goes up because everybody scrambles to get everything done before the credit uh, disappears and goes off the books. Now, just a few comments on Germany. Um, as was mentioned earlier, well, first of all, how many people here know what a feed-in tariff actually is? Okay, so most people, but not everybody. Basically, a feed-in tariff is that uh, the government or your utility essentially will pay you a fixed rate for any surplus energy that your solar system sells back into the grid. So at the end of the month, if you've supplied all your megawatt, sorry, all your kilowatt hours of power, but you had excess, basically the grid is buying it from you at a certain fixed price. Pretty simple idea. Uh, and this is where the kind of financial motivation can come into it. It gives us all the opportunity to be sort of mini generators selling our juice, or at least maybe not making money, but certainly reducing our electricity price, which actually is, can be in, the, in terms of actually making money. So what we've seen in Germany, though, and one of the challenges, as was mentioned, is that feed-in tariffs essentially are set by policymakers at a certain level. Uh, and it, they represent an estimate as to what the right amount is in order to motivate consumers to put uh, PV panels on their roofs or small businesses to put PV panels on their roofs. 
And it's, a, it's an inexact science, I think any policymaker will admit. And one of the challenges is that every time you lower it, you have the chance of essentially killing the market. And so what you've seen in Germany is these incredible quarters of installations of uh, photovoltaics. So you see here, for instance, in Q2 2010, there was about three gigawatts installed. They lower the, the feed-in tariff and boom, you drop down to 1.5. Uh, it starts to actually build back up again, and then again it gets lowered and boom, it drops. This is a lot like the slide you see of the production tax credit. When the production tax credit expires, boom, you see a drop in, in installations. Um, and so the challenge, of course, is to try and do this in, for a policy person, is to try and do this in an organized way so that the market understands what you're up to, what your rationale is. Um, but I would argue that even more importantly is to make sure that what you're doing is in sync with what's going on in the market. So in other words, if the cost of a photovoltaic system is dropping, you want to be dropping at about the same rate that you're offering consumers. If you're doing it too slowly, then you're, frankly, you're letting people make a killing on selling their power back to the grid. That's inappropriate, and it's a waste of taxpayer money. If you do it too fast, and you come in below it, then you kill the market, and there's no financial incentive for people to do this. So this is one of the ongoing challenges, and you can see in Germany, this line here represents the actual feed-in tariff, and this represents what was our estimate of the underlying system costs. And you can see, basically, policymakers did their best to try and keep up with what was a very rapidly uh, declining market uh, overall. Uh, but it's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's a challenge going forward. And of course, it has a cost. And I do think it's important to note that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So if you're the one selling the juice off your, from your roof back into the grid, and you're getting paid a premium for it, well, someone's paying for that, right? Um, and in the case of Germany, it is actually, you know, it's part of the public, viewed as a public good, and I believe it's the taxpayer that essentially picks up the tab. So you can see here, this is our estimate of the annual liability by European governments to pay for this year on year. And you can see 2013 overall, we're probably looking at about 20 billion euro across the EU to cover these costs. It's not free. Um, but, you know, the reality of it also is that um, once you've once you've essentially uh, guaranteed that you're going to pay this, uh, then you know the price of the electricity. So in other words, this is our estimate. It's probably relatively reliable. Whereas if you were to ask me what's it going to cost for, some, for a German homeowner to, 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 you know, to continue to buy electricity that perhaps comes from natural gas imported from Russia or other places, or nuclear or other places, we don't know the price. There is inherent price volatility in other forms of power generation. So, you know, you're looking at eliminating essentially that volatility, but it doesn't come for free to do this. So with that, I just want to say thanks very much and look forward to your questions. Thanks, thanks so much, Ethan. Um, I, I also just wanted to mention, it, I believe it's my understanding that, um, that with regard to the FIT, that the cost is not borne by taxpayers, but instead by ratepayers. So that one of the ways the system is different from our production tax credit is that it it actually um, uh, goes to ratepayers. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Um, before we start our Q and A, I also just wanted to quickly mention that um, because as Ethan was also talking about this kind of up and down, very uh, erratic kind of journey that one has as policies end up being changed. Uh, abruptly, I think that most people are therefore aware that as we look at the production tax credit coming to an end at the end of this year without the extension, and you saw Ethan's slides on that, that um, I wanted to bring to your attention, and I think we have a copy of the letter out on our table, that the Investor Network on Climate Risk just sent a letter to the Congress yesterday um, raising their concerns about this issue and they're concerned that why it was important for that particular tax credit to be extended um, and that was signed and you might find it interesting in terms of looking at all of the financial um, houses and banks and, um, and pension funds that uh, have invested are, are invested and are very concerned about clean energy and that there are hundreds of billions of dollars in their investment portfolios and they have uh, really staked a claim to how important this issue is. So I wanted to call that to your attention. Let's open it up for your discussion, your questions, your comments. 
And, okay, and if you could identify yourself, please. Mike, why don't you start? You know, there was so much hope um, that we would scale up relatively quickly, perhaps, on ele electric cars, because you know there, there, there is sort of the synergies between. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, of course. I mean, I meant this as a global, as a global, as a global issue. Um, you know, I mean, there are obviously uh, some technologies that are better suited to work even if you don't have um, storage in, in place. And, and storage is clearly something that needs uh, needs perhaps uh, more focus. I mean, that's why, in, you know, there the, the, the problem with um, CSP, for example, it, or uh, it's not a problem, it's a benefit, is that, you know, it is... Um, it can fulfill your your base load in 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 some ways, um, but uh, the 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 trouble is that the cost of the technology it's unclear how quickly that can come down. And you know we are involved in uh, in, in in CSP um, in um, in the MENA region because there is of course you know great hope there lots of land and lots of sun. Um, that that technology could uh, could actually work uh, quite well there, but you know you're, you're right to pointing it out. But you know it's not not sufficient attention perhaps so far. Um, but of course we have looked on that uh, in the German energy policy making. Um, actually, it won't be so much of an issue within the next ten years. Um, and we have different views on how to solve the problem. Uh, it won't be a total physical storage, as some people point out. This would be extraordinary cost. Uh, we look uh, to the grid, which should be more efficient. So we look at smart grids and solutions uh, with better exchange between supply and demand. And we are already making experiences with that. And the second. Um, thing is that we are making our grid more flexible. So we're extending our grids, that's one thing, and we're making it more flexible in the rural areas. So this would be very important as well. The third thing is we're looking at storage solutions which are cheaper than building own ones uh, in other countries who have big potentials like Norway or in the Alps. Uh, the third thing is looking at gas solutions. So uh, we could use extra wind production for uh, producing hydrogen, for instance. So there are different technical solutions. We haven't decided for one solution yet, but we look at, at those, and we will need them in 10, 20 years. Yes. I'll just add one quick point on that. Also, just to, to Sabine's point about electric vehicles, um, one of the interesting things that we've seen is clearly a disappointing number of sales of electric vehicles compared to what the automakers were predicting. And that is creating an oversupply situation in, 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 uh, in lithium-ion battery manufacturing. But interestingly enough, some of the lithium-ion battery ma makers are now trying to get more into providing grid storage because they need a new market because the vehicle market hasn't accelerated quite as quickly as they had hoped. Now, uh, I'm, I'm no technical expert. I'm, I might, some, I've heard from some folks that lithium-ion isn't necessarily the best technology for grid storage. But if it's going to be the cheapest technology, it may be the one that gets some traction relatively quickly. Right. I'm really glad you raised that, Ethan, because I've been hearing that too. And we hope to put together a briefing that will look at storage because it is a huge issue. And I think there's a lot going on. Okay. Over here.
what we have at the moment is uh, an emission trading system, a European-wide emission trading system, which, as you might know, is in, uh, with regard to the price, isn't accurately working at the moment. Uh, so the price is too low. So it, it, it doesn't stop anybody from using fossil fuels. Uh, we have discussed that, uh, that issue, uh, and it's a very difficult, as, as a new country, a very difficult thing to discuss uh, in public. Uh, because people don't like taxes, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but of course, um, the emission trading scheme uh, in general touches that issue. And as soon as there is a scarcity uh, of allowances, then the system would work. At the moment, it does not. Worth adding that, um, in fact, you know, it's actually, unfortunately, just the reverse. If you look, I don't have the latest numbers, but you know, like a year ago, I, I, I think um, the IEA put out some some data that um, that added up globally the subsidies that are paid for renewables, which was something like in the order of 57, 60 billion, and uh, the fossil subsidies around the globe are six times that amount, right? So, I mean, instead of saying we are compensating for the externalities that the fossil fuel are generating, we are, you know, kind of just doing the reverse. We are uh, benefiting them by providing, you know, 300 plus billion per annum globally in subsidies to uh, fossil fuels. No, I mean, not too much to add, except for that that, that that gap still does exist. It's a little narrower now. And actually, a big part of that $300 billion, interestingly enough, was the fact that Iran was subsidizing its gasoline price when oil prices were really high, and that's not because oil prices have come down. But still, there, there's no question it's, it's you know, whatever it is, three or four times as large in terms of the subsidy size. But, you know, just, I mean, on the, on the issue of uh, carbon taxes and, and, and the, the European trading scheme, um, it, it is, of course, as Garrick said, unfortunately at the moment, uh, very sadly low prices for, for CO2, um, which, of course, has much to do with the fact the system is designed whereby, you know, allocations are determined way in advance and there is no mechanism to kind of adjust to economic realities. And the economic reality is that Europe is in a pretty slow growth scenario. And so, you know, there are lots of talks about reforming um, the EU ETS in, in, in terms of how, um, how these uh, allowances are, are generated in the, in the first place and what that path should be and what kind of potential um, interventions in the system might uh, be necessary. You know, think of carbon like money. You know, you have monetary policy, you could have a carbon central bank. Yeah, these are, you know, theoretical um, at, the, at best at the moment. But, you know, the discussion now in the U.S. about a carbon tax as a potential savior for fiscal cliff type uh, scenarios is uh, it's interesting for me to, to see that it has re-emerged. This raises, um, your question raises something that, that I think is important about the, the comprehensive nature of the energy and the, the taxes on gases, Americans who go to Germany probably know you end up paying twice as much, about twice as much for gas when you fill up your your car um, because of taxes, but that has nothing to do with renewable energy taxes or carbon taxes. That's used for one of the main reasons is, is for maintenance of highways and to discourage energy consumption, which makes more fuel efficient cars. Um, I think all of those things have to be taken into account. and. It helps to know that in the United States, we do not cover our road maintenance with the highway taxes that go, that come from fuel. That ends up each year being paid from the, by taxpayers covering the rest of it, which means that instead of internalizing the costs of roads to the people who use them, everybody ends up 
paying for them. In Germany, I think you get something like the order of twice as much money from the taxes as you pay out for infrastructure. And at the same time, your infrastructure is far more developed and up to date than the US roads, bridges, transportation infrastructure. So I just raise that as part of the, the view that this is a holistic plan and we have all sorts of things that are suffering. Our, our, our uh, fatality rate per um, driver per capita is far higher in the United States than Germany because Americans spend far more time driving because of the built environment of how roads are set up and we have poorer roads. So there are costs to um, not having a system set up very well. And I, don't, I, I think right now ours is not functioning terribly well by having such low taxes on gas because we're afraid to, politicians are afraid to raise the money that goes, that's supposed to be meeting the infrastructural cost for roads. Okay, I, uh, there are about four hands up. So we'll start back here and then, and then here and then over. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Why don't you call it? I think it's a rather uh, delicate issue. Of course, the reality looks like there is a lot of press and media reaction to the increasing price of the uh, feed-in tariff surcharge, which was just raised. And the, the newspapers are full of, uh, of um, yeah, well, news on that. Um, nevertheless, um, if you look at the details, how the price uh, is built up, then you see a development over the last 10 years that the electricity price went in the same speed up like, it, like you uh, can observe it now. And I don't want to make an issue if somebody is interested in spreading those news, but of course uh, you could imagine there are some people who are interested in making this energy vendor not so successful. And uh, our impression is uh, so the, the news are exaggerated, so they're a little bit overestimated. If you look at the facts, so an average household will have to spend like uh, in the order of between 50 and 100 dollars a year more. This is what you spend, you know, for one kid uh, for the telephone bill in one month. Uh, so I think um, people are making a point uh, out of a debate uh, just uh, exaggerated. This is one thing. The next thing is um, it was expected that we will have for the first 10 years, we will have a lot of investments, uh, particularly if we support today's uh, expansive uh, renewables. But in the midterm and in the long term, all our projections show us that this will switch. So in the long term, we will have, in the medium term, we will have a cheaper energy supply than we will have now. It is rather difficult to explain. So we are still in a, you could say, information uh, war in Germany, and uh, it's, it's rather difficult to explain the details, and it's easy to write down. It's too expensive, and it doesn't work. We are convinced it will work, and it will be cheaper in the midterm. If I could just add one quick thing, which is, um, uh, in, in, and this is from abroad, and, and we have folks in London who, who frankly supplied me with this information, but basically I understand that the, there's new taxes essentially or, or new rate hikes being imposed to help try and cover some of these costs that, that have been created by solar. But the interesting thing about it is if you actually raise the, the final electricity price to consumers, right, you actually just give them more incentive to go solar, right, because then the higher their electricity bills every month, 
then the, the more they want to put a system on their roof so they don't have to pay that bill. So it, it, it's going to have an interesting effect, I think, potentially of continuing actually to drive, um, to drive demand, um, you know, going forward. And I'd like to add just one thing to that, that the, um, the prices, it, you again have to look at a lot of different things to see what the price and the cost, um, how that all plays out. Wholesale price of electricity in Germany now, my understanding, and somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, is wholesale prices are now cheapest at the middle of the day in Germany when demand is greatest and most expensive at around 4 a.m. when demand is very little. And that's due to the nature of photovoltaics, which now supplies so much electricity that now, um, it, on a few days this year, PV actually provided more than 50% of electricity going into the German grid. So it, that drives down the wholesale power prices and one last thing to remember on that is, where does that money go? Well, more than half of that money goes to German citizens who are, the gener who are generating it, which is why there's not the kind of outrage that one would expect um, in the United States if, if everybody's bills were raised. Well, half of them are getting that money back. They're making money on that. Um, and also there's a broad consensus in Germany across all political parties that this is worth doing, that the renewable energies path is the right one to be on. Uh, unlike in the United States, uh, people I talk to in uh, three different political parties all support this, and it's just a measure of, uh, a matter of how exactly you do it. Okay, thank you. Did you have a question? Okay, Andrew, you first. Take a quick whack at it. I mean, not surprisingly, you know, the more certainty, the better. And um, when you get a clear directive and a goal set at the federal level, that's the kind of thing that investors like to hear. And you're right, there's a difference between the U.S., where the most important, well, not all the most important, but many of the most important clean energy policies have come at the state level. I would argue, actually, that the stimulus bill was probably the most important piece of clean energy legislation ever passed in the United States. That was at the federal level. But we still don't have a national goal and target. Uh, one last comment, though, on China, which is, I think China is in incredibly fascinating. And I don't think, though, I think the Western perception always is that it's very top down and the central party decides everything. We're going to see a very interesting period in Chinese solar in the next year or two where that theory gets put to the test. Because there are a lot of local photovoltaic equipment makers in a lot of provinces that are struggling right now. And the central government wants that industry to consolidate to a small number of players. But a lot of the provincial government leaders are not so keen on having a big plant that employs five or 10,000 people in their neighborhood go under in the name of a national plan. So I don't think that the situation in China is as clear and top down as we often think that it is. Did you have a question? Okay. And uh, Dr. Milton, you, you mentioned the need for the public-private uh, partnerships and the policy-business partnerships. I'm just wondering if you could expand on that. Um, you know, what type of need is it? Maybe more important, who are those actors that maybe stand in the middle that are or should be responsible for, for that kind of collaboration? So, let me just give you um, an example. Um, 
you know, again, coming back to the German, the German experience and, ger and what the German government um, has been doing, you know, you have s different types of risks that are associated with building a renewable project, from regulatory risk, to technology risk, the risk of operating the asset, and so on, right? There are some risks that are uh, more suitable to be taken by public players, and then there are some risks that are more suitable being taken by the business players. And so it's to figure out what is that allocation of risk and who can take them on. So that's the, the, basic, the basic concept. And um, in, in the German government, for example, has put in place a fund. Which it's called the, the Global Climate Partnership Fund, which is a public-private fund where the government has put in um, a first loss guarantee in case there is a disaster happening with that project and it doesn't perform. Um, then you have a number of public um, institutions, German and, uh, and, and, and foreign, who are putting in the next tranche of risk taking, so to speak. And then on top of that, you have private investors who provide the rest of the financing, and all of this gets deployed in actually in emerging markets in, in, in 13, 14 um, countries around the world in energy efficiency and uh, renewable and renewable projects. And so that's th these kinds of funds, you know, they can also work, of course, at the local level uh, or at the at the national level. So there could be a U.S. Um, there has been conversations around a, a green bank or, you know, things like that. Green bank becomes immediately a big apparatus, in my opinion. But, you know, a fund structure is, is, is something more flexible because it gets more easily dismantled when no longer needed. Whereas if you build an institution, it will be around 50 years later, even though you may not need it anymore. So, but it is really that kind of sharing of risks. Um, that uh, that that is required um, and, and and is working extremely well already in some in some examples that uh, we have. We'll just take a couple more questions right here first. Mm -hmm. A big question and an important one. Um, just sort of generally, I mean, I showed that chart of this incredible decline in the cost of equipment, and now that's leading to a decline in the cost of a system, and how that's leading to a decline in the sort of so-called levelized cost of energy, or the the price at which uh, a generator can sell their power. Um, in the long story short, when you build a wind project, you basically have two kinds of costs. You have the equipment that you need to buy and put in and put in there, and then the, the cost of the money that you borrow. But there's no fuel cost, right? You're not buying any fuel. So this is why the, the, the cost of the financing is just absolutely critical to determining the long-term cost of a project. And while we've seen this incredible progress in the technology, we actually haven't seen what I would consider any particularly spectacular progress in the cost of financing. So of that 280 billion bucks that I showed, the total money that had gone into the industry, um, you know, about 220 is to actually build a project. And of that, I don't know, 95 percent of that is basic um, various kinds of project finance loans. They're not sophisticated bonds. Uh, they're, in other words, the clean energy industry right now is not being financed in the same way that the oil and gas industry is by floating bonds or by master limited partnerships or other things. So there's some growing up that has to take place in the industry in terms of the way that it gets financed. I think there's a lot of reasons that hasn't happened, but I think it's going to start happening. And so we saw Warren Buffett, for instance, buy a project and float a bond to finance it just this past year. Um, we've seen other similar kinds of projects come along like that. And bonds really are going to be the wave of the future, especially as some of these projects start to perform for a few years. They show they can kick off cash in a reliable manner, then they can be refinanced potentially with a big bond offering in that kind of way. So that's one kind of bond which 
which I think the industry really needs, because the cost of capital has to come down. And the kind of good news is that that's actually, I would argue, maybe an easier thing, a less painful thing to reduce the cost on than all the tumult that goes along with, you know, uh, with an industry that's, that's right now having its ups and downs. On the PACE bonds, that's a much more localized question, and I know that one of the challenges there really has simply been that the, the senior lenders for, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, what the, I, I, don't, I don't know my housing agencies well enough, but I think the, whoever's backing Fannie and Freddie is not keen on being uh, in any way insubordinate on any kind of a loan uh, that's out there, and so they're not really willing to show much flexibility on that. And I, I, I don't know enough about the subject, but I think that you know perhaps if that could be changed I don't know what legislative change needs to take place, but something has to happen for PACE bonds to become viable again. I just, I mean, one final additional comment is just, you know, the general debt market has been, global debt market has been in not exactly excellent shape. So, you know, I think the, the, the financial crisis hasn't really helped to come up with, with great innovations on the, on the debt side in particular, but I agree it's coming. I might also mention that Master Limited Partnership legislation for renewables has been introduced in the Senate and bipartisan legislation so that, you know, recognizing that that is another thing that's been available to the fossil fuel industry has not been utilized by, by renewables, had not been allowed before. Okay, um, back here first. Go ahead. That's a, I'm not sure I can answer that in two minutes. Um, you know, it depends. So, for example, we have a private equity fund that we that that we manage. Um, you know, there, you know, you are tr you are basically trying to find opportunities where, within you know five to seven years, the latest, you can you know, get your money back, so to speak, and more. Um, when, when we look at um, financing opportunities for, um, you know, I don't know, a, a capital market kind of financing, um, you know, it, we are acting mostly as an, an underwriter of, um, as an underwriter, so we are we are raising capital on behalf of a client. So it's the investor who is who is looking to put their money into the bond or the equity offering of that of that of that of that client. And oftentimes they, they you know this depends of course which market um, the uh, the borrower or the equity issuer is is operating. So. You know, to say um, you ca you can operate comp you cannot operate in isolation from the uh, the political the political envi environment. Perhaps the best able in, in in private equity potentially, because technology is so much more important than most other things. Um, I think that we're past our hour here, and so um, I would like to thank all of our speakers very, very much. And I also just wanted to mention, too, that I, while these end up being quite complex issues, one of the, it's still my observation that there is a lot of interest at the national level, at the federal level, in moving policy forward. There are differences of opinions, to be sure, but what we have to think about are how we can solve multiple problems and achieve multiple benefits at the same time as we look at the challenges facing our different countries and how we can truly learn from each other. So I want to thank again our speakers very, very much. 
And if you've got questions or whatever, please feel free to follow up with them or contact us at EESI and we will try and get you the answers and briefings will be posted, the presentations will be posted on our website shortly. So thank you all very, very much, appreciate it.